But then, as that verse in the Bible implies, a new Pharaoh drove out the shepherd kings and brought the Israelites under the law of the land, which has always included forced agricultural labor. And you can picture them using this very implement to irrigate the fields. It's called a shadu. And its buckets tip the water up into the ditches, and then these wheels raise the water again to a higher level. It doesn't look very arduous work, but then you've got to remember that to a nomad, manual labor of any kind is not only a hardship, but an indignity. And at first, no doubt, this was really all the Israelites were complaining against. The bricks they made are still made and used in the same way. Mud is mixed with water, and then both are mixed with chopped straw. And the point of the straw is not only that it binds the brick, but that it prevents the mud from sticking to the builder's hand and the mold from sticking to the ground. So you can see that when the Egyptians refused to supply straw any longer, and yet the Israelites had to supply the same number of bricks, that their work would have taken them more than twice as long. And this was an irritating hardship. And when that type of petty persecution turned to real oppression, then, in the end, the Israelites rebelled and fled. There you can see the straw very plainly. Tradition has it that the Israel and crossed the top of the Red Sea down into the peninsula of Sinai and that Mount Sinai is at the bottom. From there they would have turned north to Rephidim and then up to Ezion Geba and so up to Kadesh. And at Kadesh they must have stayed for several years. And in thinking about the Exodus, try first to picture the tremendous change of scenery they would have met even on their first day. The Nile is a country of trees and shade and water. But now they were in a scrubby desert where any tree is almost startling in its loneliness. Then the desert in this part of the world plays queer tricks and the wind whips up the sand into great spirals which travel over the, gr over the ground at a tremendous speed and to the Israelites must have seemed as if moved by invisible spirits. The land itself is twisted, and the wind howls in these great cavities and moans in the rocks. And as their camel's feet trod noiselessly over the sand, even at the end of their first day, the Israelites must have begun to feel something of the awe of their great adventure. Nobody knows quite where they camped, but the scene of their camping still happens every day in the desert. The leaders select a site, a long way ahead, and then make their camels kneel down. And the tribe, following in groups, every family with its camels, chooses their own site round the leaders, and the head wife makes her camel kneel, and then the bags are unloaded just where the tent is going to be raised up, and the tent is spread out over the bagging. Then the women hammer in the pegs. The women seem to do all the work, while the men sat and watched. And so the tent is raised up. Usually a woman works single-handed, and it took one woman about 20 minutes to raise a tent. In the evening, or just before sunset, the men would come in for their meal. And when there were no guests, and by now we were not considered guests, their fare would simply be a few dates and rice mixed with this sour milk called a leaven. It doesn't sound very appetizing, but they certainly thrive on it. And they eat it, as you see, out of a bowl on the ground with their fingers. And then next day the whole process would start again. And you can tell from the length of the shadows that the camp has to be moving before dawn. And while the children sleep among the baggage, the women roll up the tents and put them on camels. And here the men did help. It was about the only time we saw them doing any work. The camels protest very loudly, and the bad-tempered ones often throw off their loads. This one got muddled up in his tent poles. 
when every camel's loaded, they're let loose and stand waiting for the head wife to lead the way off. And the children and the old women are put in litters made of cane. These anther-like litters belong to the sheikh's wives and are often covered with awnings. They look very picturesque, but one of our party travelled in one for some way and soon felt very seasick. Of course, in a picture, this looks rather picturesque and romantic. But the thing to remember is that this is one of the hardest and poorest lives in the world. This tribe here had been travelling for four nights of the week, with its wells running dry and its flocks and herds starving. And they are hardened to it. Imagine what it must have been for the Israelites, fresh from the Nile. Even these men, who had never lived anywhere else, had already fallen asleep twice while we were photographing. And think of the Israelites with the pictures of the Nile in their mind, with its boats piled high with corn, and with all its water and shade and good things to eat. Is it any wonder that the congregation of the Israelites murmured against Moses and Aaron and asked to be taken back to Egypt and asked why they had been brought out into the desert to die and left the flesh pots behind them? And then, at Mara, they came to a well. And the wells in the desert are very deep and are worked either by camels or by human beings. Beginning at sunrise, they walk backwards and forwards, pulling up the skin bucket on a long rope. And you can tell from the length of this rope that this actual well was more than a hundred yards deep. It takes them all day to water their flocks and herds, so that wells are hardly a rest. Only at an oasis, as is said in Genesis, do they rest. And at an oasis, a nomad really seems to come to life and enjoy himself. And you can picture the Israelites at Rephidim and elsewhere, lazing about with their beasts and just eating and drinking, and no doubt being as difficult to manage as they were on the march, although in another way. And one of the oases was Sinai. Now you're in an aeroplane, looking at the great granite mountains in that part of the world, one of which is undoubtedly Sinai. They stand sheer out of a dead flat desert for two and three thousand feet. On top, these mountains are nothing but barren rock, dropping sheer for two and three thousand feet. And you cannot imagine any more desolate or awe-inspiring place than the tops of the Mount Sinai where Moses went up unto God. This is a model of the tabernacle made by Dr. Schick in Jerusalem according to the instructions in the Bible written about a thousand years later. That is the Holy of Holies. And that is the great altar of sacrifice in the courtyard. The real tabernacle, as the name implies, must have been one of these great goat's hair tents. And the scene outside it when the Israelites prayed, not unlike this scene, although these men, of course, are Muslim. At Sinai too, Moses organized the tribes under captains of hundreds and captains of fifty, and gave them their laws. And that system is still working today. This sheikh here is sitting to judge the people just as Moses sat. And opposite him is the accused man, and on one side his witnesses, and on the other his accusers. And the sheikh is expounding the Mosaic law and it is used even to try murder to death. 